She is a third year law student at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at ASU. Throughout her time in law school, Victoria has interned at a variety of criminal justice and civil rights agencies. Upon graduation and admission to the bar, Victoria hopes to practice as a public defender in Maricopa County. As a double devil who grew up in Arizona, she is passionate about enacting criminal justice reform within our community. Today she will be discussing public defenders and how they function and work within the criminal justice system. Through her talk, she hopes to dispel some of the myths about public defenders and the criminal justice system. All right. Okay, guys, I'm going to get going, if you, if you all don't mind, if you'll have me. Um, so, like these lovely ladies said, uh, my name is Victoria Como. I'm a third-year law student at ASU, um, and I'm just I'm really happy to be here. Uh, thank you to Peace and to Professor Wells for inviting me. Um, professor Wells was actually my 102 English professor back when I was an undergrad here, so uh, it's been like, God, like eight years since freshman year, so here I am. <laughs> How time flies. Um, but this is just a little bit about my background. So I am a third year law student at ASU. I'll be graduating in May. Um, and I'm planning to become a public defender upon graduation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I have a variety of experience with different uh, criminal justice agencies in Maricopa County. My first summer, I actually externed at the county attorney's office, which is the prosecutorial office. Um, I wanted to see both sides of criminal law and how it worked uh, on both ends. and then. Once I got to the public defender's office, I, uh, I'm a true believer, so uh, I haven't left public defense since I got there. Um, so yeah, I've, I've externed at uh, various different offices. I was at the ACLU, and I'm currently actually working as a law clerk at the Maricopa County Public Defender's Office. Um, and I wouldn't be a future lawyer if I didn't do a disclaimer. So all opinions and views that I share today are mine and are not representative of any public defense or criminal justice agency in Arizona, including the Maricopa County Public Defender's Office. Always got to protect yourself with liability. Um, so today I really just kind of want to talk about and maybe dispel some of the misconceptions we have around public defense and public defenders. Uh, the question I most often get when people are like, oh, you're in law school, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I want to do indigent defense. They're always like, how can you defend people like that? Why would you want to do that? Do you like crime? you like criminals? Um, so first of all, what is a public defender? For those of you who don't know, it's a government-provided attorney. For those who are indigent, or in other words, poor, uh, and are unable to afford their own legal representation. So uh, for all offenses that carry a possible penalty of imprisonment, you, if you cannot afford your own defense attorney, you are assigned a public defender. Um, and this is guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment and a landmark case called Guinea v. Wainwright. Read it if you have time. It's a great case. Um, and unless a defendant makes a full and voluntary waiver of his right to counsel, then any defendant who has been charged with a crime that is punishable by imprisonment has a right to counsel. So obviously all felonies um, because those are punishable by a year or more in prison, and then some misdemeanors which are punishable by up to six months in jail, uh, you get a public defender. If the only uh, like ex situation in which you wouldn't get a public defender would be if you are charged with a misdemeanor where from the start they say, we're not looking to give you any jail time, we're not going to give you any jail time off the bat. So here are some of the biggest common misconceptions about public defenders. The first being that we work with or for the state and are against our client. Um, obviously, the, the clientele we come into contact with on a daily basis have a lot of distrust in the system, and reasonably so. It, uh, even if they're new to the system or if they've been in the system for a long time, there's a lot of reasons for them to be skeptical of us because we are indeed county employees and we are indeed paid by the taxpayers. Um, and so a lot of times you meet your clients and they don't think they can trust you. There's a lot of talk that goes on in jail that says we're just public pretenders and we're going to go tell the county attorney everything you say and everything you tell us. None of that is true. Uh, there is attorney-client privilege and confidentiality. Anything we learn in the course of representation of a client, we ethically cannot disclose to anyone outside of our office unless you give us explicit permission to do so. So no, we're not running to the county attorneys and telling them everything you tell us. Um, the second one would be that we're incompetent and incapable. A lot of times people are like, oh, you're going to be a public defender. That means you can't get another job in the law. 
which is, from my experience, personally not true. Everyone I know that works in the office or wants to work in the office is there because they're incredibly passionate about criminal justice reform and about constitutional rights and standing up for the people in our society who are marginalized and infringed upon by our criminal justice system. Um, it's not a job that is just a bunch of like law students who got C's in all their classes and couldn't get work anywhere else. We're there because we want to be there. Uh, the next misconception would be that we're just a bunch of slick, dishonest, and amoral people. That's the other one you get is like, oh, you represent criminals. You must be a bad person or you like crime. Um, we're not Saul Goodmans. This is not Better Call Saul or Breaking Bad. <laughs> That's not how it works. Um, certainly, like, you have some attorneys out there in every type of law that just want to make money. But for those of us who work in public defense, we're not charging you by the hour. We're getting paid a salary no matter what happens. Uh, and we're there because we want to help you and we want to try to represent you and make sure we're protecting your rights. The other big one is that we're in search of technicalities to get clients off. I hear that all the time. It's like, oh, that person got off on a technicality. And it's, in my opinion, the Constitution is not a technicality. <laughs> Considering we base our entire democracy on it, uh, having your constitutional rights and civil rights protected is not a technicality. And finally, oh, I've mentioned this already, that we're unable to work anywhere else. Oft and I find that that's very not true. I came into law school knowing I wanted to do this kind of work, and all of my friends and coworkers are the same way. So as for the duties of a public defender, uh, we have a difficult task. We are supposed to be both officers of the court and also loyal and zealous advocates for our clients. So we both work for the county and we, you know, we are officers of the court and we have duties as a result of being an officer of the court. But rather than like a prosecutor where their client is the state and they work explicitly for the county and they're supposed to represent county interests, we also have a client who has their own unique experiences and interests and needs. And we are supposed to balance the representation of both of those. So our primary duties include serving as our client's counselor and advocate uh, with courage and devotion to ensure that their constitutional and other legal rights are protected and to render effective and high quality legal representation with integrity. So that's just a brief overview about what a public defender is and what we do. Uh, I want to just kind of go through some of how the Arizona system works. So what happens when you first come in contact with the criminal justice system here and just briefly go through the steps you will experience if you're a defendant in the system and what happens along the way, as well as highlighting some of what I think are the key issues in the Arizona criminal justice system. So first thing that happens, you have some kind of contact with law enforcement. Typically, uh, you know, you're arrested for something. If you're arrested and you're booked and you're not released, um, you have a initial appearance. So you, if they book you into jail, you're in jail. And within 24 hours of being in jail, you're supposed to have what's called an IA or an initial appearance. And it's at that, it usually happens in what we call jail court, where you go see a judge at the jail. Uh, you're inform, informed of the charges against you, and you're informed that you have a right to an attorney. And at that point, the court will make a determination based on a financial affidavit whether or not they consider you indigent. Um, so basically, they ask for a bunch of information about your finances, and on, on the basis of that information, they'll determine whether you are going to be assigned a public defender. And in most circumstances, a public defense agency is assigned at the IA. So there's four different agencies in Maricopa County. So they'll assign you to the Maricopa County Public Defender's Office or the Office of the Legal Defender. But you won't actually have a lawyer. You won't actually see a lawyer or have a lawyer with you at the IA. And then in some circumstances, um, you know, you don't have an IA. So if you're arrested and released, say it's like a low-level misdemeanor, they arrest you and then let you go and don't book you into jail, then you're going to get what's called a court summons and you're told to come back on that day. And that's when you would be assigned a public defender. So this is where it first gets problematic, step one of the process. Your initial appearance is incredibly critical um, because this is where your release conditions are set. So this is the determination of whether you're going to stay in jail or get out of jail. Um, and without an attorney, because when you're at the IA, they'll say, okay, you're indigent, you're going to get an attorney, you have a right to an attorney, but you don't have one right now here in this hearing. 
uh, a judge is going to determine what your release conditions are or if you're getting released at all. Uh, and so that involves typically cash bail. So they're going to make a determination based on your flight risk, the danger you pose to society, um, your ties to the community, a bunch of different factors. Uh, the judge is going to determine what your bail is, how much your bail is, uh, what other conditions you might have. So even if you can pay bail, say your bail's set at $5,000 and you can't actually afford that, they might also release you to electronic monitoring or require that you participate in drug or alcohol testing, require that you participate in substance abuse counseling, uh, a variety of different pretrial services that they can order that you partake in. But the biggest problem is for most people, if you're at the IA and you're in front of a judge and there's a prosecutor there arguing to the judge why you should stay in jail and why you should have a high bail and you're by yourself, the average defendant who comes into the system is not going to know what factors the judge is going to consider or how to effectively argue those factors to the judge. And this poses a huge risk for our clients because at this point they either have to forfeit their right to remain silent and argue for their own release or choose to remain silent and be unable to advocate for themselves. But if you speak, if you choose to argue for your release at your IA, you're risking incriminating yourselves because again, typical criminal defendants don't have a legal background and are, you know, are not going to be aware of what they should and should not say to a judge or a prosecutor. And again, most of the time release involves cash bail. So if you're someone who can't afford the bail that's set, you're going to be staying in jail. So there are plenty of clients who maybe they've committed a low level, non-violent, non-dangerous drug offense, and they're going to sit in jail until their case gets resolved because they can't afford $2,000 in bail. And if you're sitting in jail while you're waiting for trial, which can take months to years, uh, there's a huge cost there. Um, because what happens when you suddenly disappear from your own life? You risk losing your job. You risk losing housing, transportation. Uh, a lot of clients, you know, if they have family and community support, that may go away if they're sitting in jail. Uh, if they have children, they're not able to be there or parent their kids. And if you're a student, for example, you know, you're not in school and you're not participating in educational opportunities. And then on top of that, from the lawyer side, uh, a client that is sitting in jail is not as effective in helping me represent them than one who can come to my office and meet with me and we can talk on the phone and constantly be in contact about their case and their needs and what's going on. All right, so after you've had your, you've been charged, you've had your IA, or you've been arrested rather, you've had your IA, this is when you get formally charged. So the police will arrest you and they'll submit to the prosecutors hey, we think person X should be charged with these three crimes. And then the prosecutor makes that final decision with what you actually get charged with. And there's two main ways in Arizona in which you can be charged. The first of which is a preliminary hearing. So a prosecutor will file what's called a direct complaint saying, you know, we allege that defendant X committed this crime and this crime on this date in violation of these statutes. If you have a preliminary hearing, what happens is you go in front of a judge, you have your attorney with you, uh, and the prosecutor's there. The prosecutor will put on typically the police officer that arrested you as a witness. The prosecutor will ask the police officer a bunch of questions, and what they're trying to establish is that there's something called probable cause for you to be charged. So it's a very, 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 very low bar for you to have probable cause for charges, but they're basically trying to say, the judge is making a determination that yes, it's reasonable that this person could have committed this offense and the case should go forward. So the prosecutor will do that. The pro of a preliminary hearing is that because the defendant is present and they're present with an attorney, their attorney then gets to get up and cross-examine that arresting officer. And this is really great for later on because whether it be in plea negotiations or if you choose to go to trial, you've locked down that officer's testimony. So sometimes we can figure out what the legal issues are in a case by talking to the arresting officer or sometimes, you know, if we do go to trial and on trial when I'm crossing him, he says something totally different, I can then impeach him with that statement because he made it under oath in court. However, the more common route in Arizona is what we call grand jury indictment. So a grand jury indictment is a secret proceeding 
It's in, there's no judge present. It's in front of a panel of jurors. Uh, there's no public defender. The defendant does not get to be there. So it's just the prosecutor and the jurors and whatever witness the prosecutor puts on. And in a grand jury, whereas in a preliminary hearing, they need the officer that was predominantly involved in the case in order to establish probable cause. In a grand jury, the rules of evidence don't apply, so they can pull any police officer, put them on the stand, hand them a police report, and say, read this. And they'll be able to establish probable cause with that, even though that police officer doesn't have personal knowledge of what happened or what is alleged to have happened. So this is obviously a very problematic system because the defendant basically has no rights there. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what happens. You don't know what the prosecutor is saying. Uh, and there's this famous quote by this judge that a grand jury would indict a ham sandwich if you ask them to. And it, it really is true. The, getting a grand, juror, grand jury to not indict is a very, very rare occurrence. And more and more in Arizona, we're seeing the move away from preliminary hearings and two grand juries. In fact, I have a friend who works in the office who was in the middle of a preliminary hearing where the arresting officer identified the wrong person as the defendant. And the prosecutor called for a recess, went upstairs, and indicted the person instead. And that was OK. So in my opinion, this system is incredibly predatory to indigent defendants. So after you've been formally charged, whether through a preliminary hearing or a grand jury, then you're arraigned, which is basically like the same thing as your IA. You go before a judge. He tells you what you've been charged with. He tells you what your rights are. And then you enter a plea of guilty or not guilty. There's really no such thing as a guilty arraignment. No judge will let you just off the bat plea straight to a case. Um, so they will always enter a not guilty for you. And then if there's plea negotiations that follow that, you can have what's called a change of plea to enter a not guilty plea. So after you've been arraigned, then there's just this pretrial period in time in which we're doing the bulk of our work, which is filing motions, asking for evidence to be suppressed, um, asking to keep evidence out because it's too prejudicial to our client, a whole bunch of different fun, boring legal things. Fun to me, boring to you guys. Um, and in that, during that time, we're getting discovery. So the prosecutor and the public defender are exchanging evidence. There's some requirements for a defense attorney to provide discovery to the state, but most of those requirements are on the prosecutor and on the state uh, because the state doesn't have a right not to incriminate itself, whereas we have the Fifth Amendment on the public defense side. And if I find out information that incriminates my client, I'm not, I don't have to turn that over to the state. I don't have to incriminate my client, and I wouldn't incriminate my client. So another huge area of issue I take in the Arizona criminal justice system is what we call our Rule 11 hearing and evaluation process. So if at any point during from arrest to trial, if at any point the prosecutor, the public defender, or the judge thinks that the defendant might not be competent to stand trial because he can't understand and assist in his own defense, then a Rule 11 psychiatric evaluation is requested. So I have an ethical duty, even if I know that this is going to be more problematic on my client and cause more issues in his case and slow him down, I have to, if I think he can't understand me and can't help in his own defense, I have to request this hearing. So basically what happens is the client will meet with uh, doctors who will evaluate the client, write a report, and then submit that report to the judge. And the judge will re review this report and make a determination as to whether the client is competent or incompetent. If the judge finds you competent, great, process keeps moving. If you're found incompetent, then the judge has to make a second finding as to whether you're restorable or not restorable. If they're restorable, the criminal case is put on hold while the defendant then receives mental health treatment. If you're found not restorable, the criminal case will be dismissed However, the judge could order involuntary commitment if they think you need it. So either outcome might not be that great. This is really problematic because even though I said you receive mental health treatment, it's not the kind of treatment that you might imagine. It's not actual uh, counseling or therapy. It's basically a class where the client is taught 
what the criminal justice system is. So this is who a judge is. This is what a jury is. This is what a jury does. This is what the judge does. This is what the prosecutor does. This is what the defense attorney does. This is what a trial is. So they're basically getting the defendant up to speed and stabilized long enough that they can stand trial and sit through trial without actually fixing any underlying psychological, mental, emotional issues that might be driving that quote unquote incompetency. And this process can take a very long time. It can take up to 21 months and it can be repeated as many times as possible. So you might go through and it could take 21 months for them to find you, you know, first they find you not competent but restorable and it takes 21 months and they say, okay, you're restored. And then two more months pass, something happens, say the client loses their mother while they're sitting in jail and that sets the client off and they go back to being not competent then the process starts all over again. So this can, especially for those who are sitting in jail while they await trial, this can prolong their incarceration by an incredible amount. And it's especially harmful to those clients who are probation eligible and might not actually be facing any jail or prison time. And they're sitting there kind of wasting away in jail while they wait for a trial that's never gonna happen because once they're finally found competent, uh, the state's gonna offer a plea deal. And that plea deal is gonna be pr to probation. And I've, I've experienced that before where I had a client who it was his first offense. He had clearly some serious mental health issues. He was young and he sat in jail for over a year for something where we knew the plea was going to be to probation. But you can't sign a plea deal saying you're agreeing to say you're guilty to a crime if you're not competent. And again, if you're someone who is having these mental health problems, being in jail is not going to really help that mental health issue. You're confined, you're away from any support system you have, your family, your friends. You don't have access to the appropriate treatment or medication. Um, our health system in our jails and prisons is a whole other issue that we could talk about for a whole other hour on a whole other day. But you're not getting access, clients are not getting access to really what they need. It's just getting them to a level where we think they know enough to sit through trial. So ultimately, why do we imprison people? There's five purposes that we've decided in the criminal justice system validate imprisonment. The first being deterrence. So we want to discourage people from committing crimes. So if I see my friend gets a DUI and ends up spending time in Tent City, I'm deterred from drinking and driving. The second being incapacitation. We want to actually physically stop people from committing crimes. Um, the third being rehabilitation, but from my experience, and I'm sure a lot of you here probably already know, uh, prisons are not actually rehabilitated, re rehabilitative. They can be, but I would say for the Arizona DOC system we have now, they are not nearly as rehabilitative as they could or should be because we don't provide the funding to fund the kinds of services, education, counseling, substance abuse treatment, all the things that client, clients actually need so that when they're released back into society, they can get back on their feet and not struggle until they reoffend. Retribution would be another one. We, we like our revenge here in America. We wanna get back at people for doing us wrong. And the final one would be restitution, um, which is that you know if you're victimized, we feel that victim is owed restitution and they should be able to get money. So on top of going to jail or prison, you might also own a very large sum to whoever you victimized. If you stole a car, you stole a bike or whatever you did, you might, oh, you hurt someone, caused them medical injury. You're going to owe them restitution. And at least for my clients who are all indigent and can't even afford an attorney, they certainly can't afford restitution. So where does this leave us? For me, it's really about context. This is the biggest thing I've learned since working in the public defense field. You have to be able to understand people's life stories in order to understand their choices. Because it's really easy to judge from the outside and say, well, why don't you just not rob a Circle K? But you don't have the context for that person and who they are, what they've grown up with, what they've been through, their experiences, their issues, the influences in their lives to understand why they're making the choices they've made. And we already know that the prison system itself is problematic, but it's incredibly important to recognize that those critical steps that are leading up to imprisonment are as flawed and prejudicial against our indigent clients than the prison system it is itself. And ultimately for me, 
Holistic defense is critical, and we need to take into consideration the entirety of a person in order to best advocate for them within their circumstances. These are just some um, things you can do if you're interested in being involved in criminal justice reform. Um, there's lots of advocacy organizations. I mean, you're all here. The fact that you're all here is a great thing. Obviously, legislation is huge. We don't have a big presence in um, the legislature. We're trying to increase that in the public defense field and get in front of our legislators more and more in order to argue for reform of the laws that put our clients in prison. Um, support peace, of course become public defenders or ethical prosecutors. We need prosecutors who are willing to wield their power wisely and with discretion rather than just following sort of the idea of I just want to win and winning is finding someone guilty regardless of whether they're actually guilty and not being empathetic or understanding their situation. Um, and if you don't want to be an attorney, you can still work for a public defense agency. There's several jobs. We have all sorts of different staff who work and are critical to us in order to support what the attorneys do. Um, and then for those of you who are students in the audience, if you're interested in being a public defender or even if you're just interested in the criminal justice reform field and you know maybe you don't want to be a lawyer but you're interested in this work, uh, the office I work for offers undergraduate internships for juniors and seniors and you would be assigned to a mitigation specialist. That's someone who's kind of like a social worker. They collect all the background on our clients, what they've been through you know, all the trauma they've experienced, their issues, their childhoods, everything. Or our initial services specialists who help people when they first come in. And then there's another scholarship as well called the Maricopa County Leadership and Education Advancing Public Service Scholarship, which will actually waive your tuition for a semester and pay you a stipend to place you in a public interest uh, office within Maricopa County, including our office, um, but there's lots of different other offices in public interest work. Um, and then you know, continue to seek education like you are all doing by hearing today and go and educate others. And then finally, if you're a voter, which I hope you all are, uh, this is a great website for comparing people when they're up for election on their where they stand on criminal justice issues. It's votesmartjustice.org. It's run by the ACLU, and I highly recommend visiting it. Thanks, guys.